mackerel sky and buttermilk sky. And this one, the cumulus cloud, is one of the few clouds that we actually um, call by its scientific or Latin name cumulus. This cloud doesn't really have a nickname, at least in English. So we're looking at these clouds and we're thinking, well, these are familiar. You glance up at them, um, you call them by the common name, and then you look away and maybe think nothing more of the cloud. But what about these clouds? What about the ones we don't recognize? And what about the ones who have names that we can't remember? How do we begin to identify and learn about these clouds? Uh, we can photograph them and try to match them up to a photograph in a field guide, and we can learn their names. But, but then what? A lot of the clouds that I saw when I began my study of clouds were completely unfamiliar. And I was um, embarrassed by this. I thought, where have I been all my life? Not looking up at the clouds, not learning their lame names. I thought, well, I must have slept through the science class in uh, elementary school where clouds were discussed. Or I didn't take the class in college that talked about atmospheric science and clouds. But I had a feeling that everyone else was talking about them behind my back, and I wasn't really sure. So I began just following my own curiosity and wondering, first off, um, what, what did I want to know about the clouds? And, and what did other people want to know? Um, when you start writing a book, you have to make sure you're not uh, rewriting uh, someone else's book, or you want to say something new. Um, and a uh, novel about clouds. What was that thing I wanted to say? And why did I think a person like me, um, a person with a very old BA in English, um, would have to say about the clouds? Could I tackle them with mere curiosity? And how was I going to find my way into the clouds? So at my age, I was uh, honest enough with myself to know that I was not going to go back to college to study meteorology. So what was I going to do? I began um, uh, my book. Um, in the very front of it, there's a, a section called A Note of Caution, which describes my approach to the book. And this story um, remembering it from an experience that happened to me really helped me um, uh, develop a compass for finding finding my way into the clouds and it also is presented um, in my book to give the readers um, a sense of why sideways is in the title and my perspective on uh, learning about the clouds so I'll just read a little a short section um, to you right now a note of caution it took me a long time to find my way into the clouds I lost my way frequently and almost gave up until I remembered a story that served as a compass of sorts, one that put me at ease as I, as I made my way. I was on my way to a new class in a two-story office building on the corner of a busy downtown intersection. It was a yoga class, but this is irrelevant. What is pertinent is that the yoga studio occupied the front corner of the building and had big storefront windows on both sides. Big signs and banners with the studio's name doubled as privacy shades from the street. While the studio itself was obvious from the street, the entrance to the studio was not. I parked my car nearby and walked toward what looked like the entry door. It was locked. I walked around the corner to a door on the other side of the building. It was locked too. I continued further along the side of the building to an unmarked door. I pulled and it opened. I stepped into a vestibule and looked for signs to the studio. There were none. I walked down a dim corridor lined with closed doors of various small businesses, none offering yoga classes. At a dead end, I found an elevator. I pushed the button. The elevator arrived, and I got on. There were buttons for three floors. I pushed the middle one. I stepped out into another hallway with more office doors. This hall only led to another dead end. I started giggling. I turned around and walked back toward the elevator, but instead of retracing my steps, I took the stairs as if to somehow outsmart this labyrinth. I walked down a flight of stairs, opened the door, and walked into an interior lobby facing the wide open doors of the yoga studio. I walked toward a small desk where a woman, the teacher I presumed, sat in her yoga togs in an aura of calm. 
Hi, I blurted out. I'm really glad I found my way in. The entrance from the street wasn't exactly obvious, so I... I then recounted my story of the locked entrance doors, the elevator, the dead-end hallways, and the stairway. She listened patiently, but didn't smile or acknowledge that the entrance was a problem. Instead, she handed me a pen, gestured toward the sign-in sheet, and said matter-of-factly, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. I was um, taken aback, as you can imagine, um, having a person I'd never met before describe exactly how I did everything. So that story is to set up um, my story of the clouds. Um, I began wandering, just as I had to finding, finding the yoga studio. It was delightfully confusing. Um, and I began looking at the clouds, taking walks, walking my dog, walking around Olympia, walking in parks, always looking up, often walking uh, into cars and tripping on curbs and tripping over my dog. I was photographing the clouds. I began reading about the clouds. And I let my curiosity lead the way. Now, I did become completely bewildered by the variety of clouds that I saw. These clouds I'm showing you now, I have no idea what they were called at the time. And I could not recall ever having seen them before. And what about these? Were these even clouds floating above the state capitol? And what about these gorgeous clouds? Were they teeny tiny cumulus clouds or something else? And why had I never noticed them before? And what about these? Why were clouds pink? Why were they purple? Why were they white? I had no idea. What about these? What is that shaft of light shining up there? And why are clouds gray? Why, why do they look dark at the bases sometimes? And this. This cloud made me want to call 911 or report a UFO on some hotline. I had no idea what I was looking at. And the more I began looking at clouds, and I began trying to talk to people in the Pacific Northwest about clouds. I realized we didn't really have a vocabulary. We didn't really know how to talk about clouds. And I found this surprising, and especially in a place um, where people spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, birders, kayakers, hikers, mountain climbers, we're all outdoors. But are we looking at the clouds? Are we including the skyscape in our landscape? And here um, I have a picture of a, you know, birders who are well disposed to uh, be looking at the sky and understanding the clouds um, outside, looking at birds. But are we looking at what's behind and above the birds? Are we looking at the clouds? Are we curious about those clouds in our outdoor pursuits? So to find out who knew what about clouds in my new town, I developed a uh, cloud survey on, on SurveyMonkey and asked 10 very friendly questions just to find out what people knew about clouds. And I began with my local community, but then expanded it to include people on the East Coast and the Midwest, people of all ages, just to find out if everyone had gotten the cloud education that I had somehow missed. So I had quite a few cloud-savvy people um, and quite a few people who knew nothing about clouds or knew as little as I did. A lot of them, um, I fear, were family members who, if they didn't know something, they were very happy to make something up. For instance, in the question, how many clouds can you name, these were some of the names I received. Some of these might be your answers if you participated in my cloud survey, but it was obvious um, from this, uh, these answers that we didn't really have the vocabulary um, to even talk about clouds. Uh, it's one thing, as I used to do, to point and say, wow, but that's a cool cloud, or look at that cloud, but that doesn't really help us understand them. So here are the 10 official cloud names. I learned these names eight years ago. I was too old, I thought, to be learning something I should have known in kindergarten, along with my multiplication tables and state capitals. But these are the names, and you might look at some of these and say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I've heard of those. But can you actually conjure up an altostratus or a stratocumulus? Can you identify a serocumulus? Do you know what those words mean? 
Certainly, I didn't. And I have a love-hate relationship with these Latin names, but they are, they are important to begin con conversing about the clouds. If you can't talk about something, I find that you don't notice that something. And if you don't notice that something, it gets ignored and it becomes virtually invis invisible. So without a language for talking about clouds, I have noticed we, we don't notice them. And I think increasingly uh, we need more, more eyes on the sky. So we have these, these sort of difficult Latin names. And we also, if you're a numbers person, not a word person, we've got heights. So the clouds are divided into three levels, high, middle, and low based on their altitude above the ground. And that's the base of the cloud, the bottom of the cloud, how high that is above the ground. So we have our high clouds, mid-level clouds, and low clouds. And you'll notice there's some overlap between the high and the mid-level. And then I hate to inform you that the clouds don't really like these lines and these numbers, so they don't always stay in these nice, tidy uh, levels. So. We have these difficult names and we have these elevations. It was the names I was really focused on. And I had to wonder who gave us these horrible, difficult to remember names. I discovered it was this man, Luke Howard, who was a chemist and a cloud watcher from a very young age who was fascinated with clouds and desperate, um, as was the scientific community at the time, to bring some order to the chaos of the clouds. Plants and animals are being classified according to the taxonomic system developed by Carl von Linné. And the desire was to develop a similar system for the clouds. But as you can imagine, the clouds resisted. Luke Howard came up with these names, presented them to a scientific society in 1802, and began um, the boom in cloud knowledge in uh, developing a language of the clouds and increasing the scientific community's awareness of clouds and the ability for the international community to communicate about uh, weather events in a similar language. So these are Latin names and these two illustrations here are ones that Luke Howard did to accompany his, um, his the paper he wrote based on his name. So let's look at those names again. We've got Cirrus, Cirrostratus, Cirrocumulus, Altostratus, Altocumulus, Nimbostratus, Cumulonimbus, Cumulus, Stratocumulus. So what is the problem with these names? They're confusing and they're hard to remember. And why is that? Well, they are, they all end in the syllable us. That's one of the problems. And the other problem is that those 10 names are only made up of five root words. Cirrus, Cirro, Alto, Nimbo, cumulo, cumulus, and strato. And they're combined. They either ex uh, exist singly or are paired up. But how the names are combined was never really uh, stated in any book I read. So let's break it down, make it a little bit easy. This is the kind of thing you don't find in a meteorology book. And again, not something that's taught when you learn about the water cycle class in elementary school. So if we translate the Latin uh, terms, this, the clouds make a little more sense. Cirrus means wisp. Cirro, the adjective form, means wispy. Cumulus, as in accumulate, means heap. Cumulo means heaped. Stratus means layer. You can think of stratification or stratified. And strato means layered. Two additional names are added in. Alto meaning mid-level, and nimbus meaning rain. Now, alto, I think of as being high. Think of how many ski resorts and mountain peaks are named alto or alta. But in the context of cloud Latin, it means mid-level. And nimbus, rain, we have two clouds that are named nimbus, cumulonimbus, and nimbostratus. So now we've got sort of some workable parts for our, our Latin to break these down. And what I discovered that I did while looking at the clouds was basically to ignore the Latin altogether and just look at the cloud and see, well, it's a layered heap. It's a wispy heap. It's a wispy layer. It's a rainy layer. And then eventually I would work backwards and pick up the Latin and try to get my, um, my brain wrapped around these, these names that are um, only composed 
I realized, of 12 letters, which is similar um, to the sort of the Hawaiian alphabet, which I also find very confusing. When you only have, when you have a limited number of um, letters, it does make uh, learning a new language pretty challenging. So now I'm learning a bit of Latin. I'm walking outside. I'm trying to match names to clouds. I'm trying to figure out what's happening with the clouds, why they're moving in, why they're turning colors, why they're where they are, when they are. Is there any season to the clouds? Is there a, any diurnal pattern to the clouds? I'm trying to figure all this out myself um, just based on uh, what, what I can pick up without having to invest in an atmospheric sciences degree. So I'm driving downtown um, in Olympia, Washington, where I live, and I notice this very strange cloud. And it looks to me kind of like a modern uh, art installation, like someone had projected this image of flattened marshmallows up against the sky, but it was actually a cloud. I had no idea what this cloud was, and had never seen such a cloud before. So, lucky for us, there is a group called the Cloud Appreciation Society based in London for cloud lovers all over the world. Uh, members can submit questions to the forum. So, I submitted my picture um, with a question, what kind of cloud is this? And here was my answer within 24 hours by someone posting as H. I had no idea who H was. And when I saw this name, I thought, surely H must be pulling my leg. A cloud with five names? Why not just call it alter cumulus or some type of alter cumulus? And were these extra names really legitimate? I didn't, I didn't know. But in fact, these are legitimate cloud names. And there are, in addition to the 10 basic names called uh, genera. There are 15 species and nine varieties of clouds, adding up to a completely overwhelming number of possible clouds um, in, the, in the hundreds, which I believe is probably a low ball given the variety that I see. So let's look at this sort of long impossible cloud name, and I will pronounce it for you. Alticumulus, stratiformis, perlucidus, undulatus, radiatus. What does this mean and why would anyone want to figure out what this name meant? Well, let's look at the actual cloud again. And what's interesting here is you can memorize the name, but if you break down the Latin, it really helps you look at the cloud more carefully so you see it not as simply a cool cloud, but a cloud with definite characteristics. So alto means mid-level and heap, so we know it's a mid-level heaped cloud. Stratiformis means layered in form. So this is a layer, a single uh, cloud formation that is um, um, at a similar altitude above the Earth. It looks like it's um, sort of rising up, but it's, a, it's at the same altitude. Perlucidus is one of the a trickier words. Per means through, as in uh, perforate, and lucidus is from the root lucid, meaning light. So that means light can shine through this cloud. It's not completely blocked like some of our uh, blanketing uh, nimbostratus rain clouds here. You see gaps in the cloud where light can shine through. And undulatus, you could recognize undulate in that Latin word. It means the wind is operating um, above the cloud to give it an undulating form. And then radiatus means radiate. And you can tell just by looking at this, this, the photograph that it looks like it's radiating from a point on the horizon behind the building here. Um, in fact, it is not radiating. All the lines you see are, in fact, parallel. So now that you know the name, you look at the cloud and you want to apply names to it. Now, this is one correct name. You could also have called it Altacumulus stratiformis or Altacumulus perlucidus. Um, there's no requirement to say the perfect cloud name with all the Latin, and I imagine H could have added a few more names onto this as well. So my tip here is to be um, take some interest in the cloud names if you have fun with it, but calling it a cool cloud and just looking at it and taking a photograph of it is a great step. So now I'm beginning in my 
process of writing my book to really beginning uh, beginning to enjoy, enjoy the Latin and enjoy the variety of clouds and trying to piece the puzzle together about why the clouds are where they are and what the clouds mean to me. My book is not about weather and there are so many excellent meteorologists um, who write about weather and write about clouds and that um, I'll leave that to the Jeff Renners and the Cliff Masses of the world to write about weather and what kinds of weather the clouds are indicating. I was really interested in the clouds themselves without the wind, without the rain, without the floods and storms that are associated with them. So I am loving all the beauty and the variety. I am watching clouds night and day. I have more pictures on my uh, camera of clouds than I do of my own family and in fact crashed a computer several years ago because I had too many cloud pictures on it. I was watching clouds and noticing every day new varieties that I had never seen before and couldn't match up to any of the guidebooks and couldn't put a name on. And more and more and more. It was at times so overwhelming that I thought about abandoning my, my project. I just couldn't get a grip on the cloud, uh, the, 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 the direction for my, for my book to go in. But then I realized after looking at all this variety, day after day after day, I had a problem, which was that I really didn't know what a cloud was. And it was really difficult for me to admit that, that I would recognize a cloud when I saw one, to be sure, but to give a definition, to describe a cloud in such a way that a person wouldn't confuse it with steam or uh, smoke, was, was really beyond me. So at this point, I am back at square one again, completely lost, thinking, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna write a book about clouds if I don't even know what a cloud is? So as an English major, my go-to is the Webster's Dictionary, where I began um, reading definitions of clouds. Uh, the definition wasn't too satisfactory. In fact, I couldn't conjure up a cloud from the definition if I hadn't already known what a cloud was. So I looked at other definitions, I looked at meteorology books, I went online, and every different group, every different organization had a slightly different definition of a cloud. And none of them really seemed to describe the cloud in a satisfactory way. I couldn't come up with a, a good working definition. So I typed up all the definitions and created a word cloud out of it. And that's what you see on the screen here. And this told me, showed me graphically the words in all the definitions that were the most dominant. So the 10 most dominant words in all my definitions were these you see here in the large letters. So from this mess, I created my own working definition of a cloud. A visible mass of water droplets or ice crystals suspended in the atmosphere above the earth. And it was a, a tidy, succinct definition. I let it sort of sit on my computer screen for a while. I got used to it. I couldn't add anything or take anything away from it. This seemed a really solid working definition. So I thought, great, 10 words in the definition, 10 cloud types. What a great structure for a book. But I had a problem. I didn't really understand any of the words in the definition. Why was a cloud visible? What made a cloud visible? Were there invisible clouds? Mass, is mass, are mass and weight the same? And, and how much mass are we talking about? Um, I hear that clouds weigh as much as 100 elephants. Is, how is that even possible? How was I going to understand the mass of a cloud and write about it for the general reader? What about water droplets? This was one of the most um, fascinating and difficult uh, things to write about. I thought I understood water. Uh, I really didn't understand this most miraculous substance. And in fact, I think I could have written a book called A Sideways Look at Water after, after all is said and done. Water droplets and ice crystals. I had no idea that ice was in clouds. So this was a, a new area for me to explore. Suspended, again, how is a cloud suspended? When, 
is that the right word really? I think of them as floating, but never really thought about what caused them to float or what was suspending them. And the atmosphere, where was the atmosphere? And why were our clouds where they were in the atmosphere? And then that led me to wonder about clouds on other planets where there is no atmosphere or where the atmosphere is very different. And then above, uh, this was um, one of an, another tricky word. As I, as I showed you, the clouds uh, occur in three different levels uh, in the atmosphere. But determining how high the clouds were, how high above the Earth, was really challenging. When you're looking at numbers that are 16,500 feet, 23,000 feet, 6,500 feet, how do, you, how do you judge that height by looking into space where there are no mile markers or benchmarks to tell you where those altitudes are? And why were certain clouds at certain altitudes? All those, all those um, factors came into this story. And I realized um, a lot of people um, have a difficult time even judging what 40 feet, 100 feet looks like. So I knew discussing how high above the Earth the clouds uh, are would be a really useful thing for people to learn how to see clouds, how to watch them, how to understand where they are, which clouds are low and which clouds are high. And then Earth. Um, the Earth is a major influence on cloud formation, um, obviously, but I didn't really understand that the Earth um, was very cloud-like in that it was erratic and uh, the, the orbit and the revolution around the sun and the diurnal periods of heating and cooling and the uh, currents and the um, tides and all that set up a, uh, a cloud system that is erratic, unpredictable, and constantly um, changing and fascinating. So I talk a lot about um, the influences of the uh, Earth on the clouds, sort of connecting um, the, the skyscape with the landscape. So this, so my book is structured around, around these terms, which is, the, which is the sideways approach. Most cloud books you pick up um, simply adopt the uh, order of the clouds by uh, altitude and, and go from there, starting with the low stratus clouds and moving up to the high cirrus clouds. But that structure had been done, and I was looking for something a little bit different to um, uh, allow my curiosity to kind of uh, take over here. So for instance, the, the chapter on water, just to give you a little a sample of what's going on in that chapter, I talk about um, water, um, the, the chemistry of water, uh, the oxygen and hydrogen. The, the big thing I was surprised to learn was that water, uh, water droplets, cloud drops, it, droplets are not shaped like teardrops, like this little happy, happy Mr. Drippy over here, who is the icon uh, that introduces um, school children to the water cycle and to the myth that <laughs> water is shaped like a teardrop. It's not. Uh, rain droplets are shaped like hamburger buns and cloud droplets are more or less round. So interesting for, to find out that um, at my age and realize that uh, this is what we're taught. This is the idea um, that is stuck in our minds um, as well as water looking like a Mickey Mouse molecule uh, with, the, with the ears. Um, this is a, a model that is, is useful but doesn't really get at the incredible complexity and uh, dynamism of, of water. So I talk a lot about water and its structure and why it um, allows us to see clouds at all. Now inside every droplet of liquid water is something that I like to call dirt, but scientists prefer to call particulate matter. Um, we have, even in our uh, cleanest air, we have microscopic uh, solid particles, salt, pollen, plant spores, phytoplankton, microbes, bacteria, soot, clay, nitrates, and myriad other minerals and chemical compounds. And those particles are what water vapor condenses on to become liquid. Um, Imagining dirt in the atmosphere um, as a condensation surface is easier if you imagine walking across a, a lawn um, 
uh, one morning in the summer and each blade of grass has a little droplet of water on it. That blade of grass or leaf or uh, surface um, is, is essentially a um, cooling surface for the water vapor to condense on and become liquid water that we see. In the atmosphere, we obviously don't have blades of grass, but the same process is happening. We have these small particles that the um, water droplets, um, the water vapor droplets condense on. Also in this chapter, I talk about um, cloud types. One um, in the left corner here that you, um, I hope, have seen on, over Mount Rainier or another um, uh, lofty mountain are the Alto cumulus lenticularis. Um, this is the cloud that started the UFO craze in 1947 because it was uh, believed to look like uh, flying saucers. And in fact, they are um, very stunning. And I can imagine that the idea that they would be flying saucers landing on uh, the, the flanks of Mount Rainier is very, very compelling, um, especially at sunset when they take on these um, sort of surreal orange and pink colors. I, in my research uh, for my book, I tried to uh, get in the right place where I could see the cloud um, that I wanted to see, for, but it found it very difficult to plan a trip to Mount Rainier um, to go see an Altocumulus lenticularis. I did organize my book at one point around the different uh, bioregions of Washington State thinking I would travel to each region and see the region's distinct cloud. I began um, in the Olympic rainforest thinking I was going to go see Nimbus stratus, the rain clouds in the rainforest. I thought that would be perfect. When I got there one April weekend, it was the only sunny weekend they had had in months. And my stratocumulus and my Nimbus stratus clouds were nowhere to be seen. So I gave up trying to plan uh, my research um, that way and just began basically um, sort of a serendipitous um, journey into the clouds. The cloud you see here over Mount Rainier is a cap cloud, um, a cloud I did not expect to encounter on a beautiful sunny day. Um, this was on a, um, a trip with my father. We were just up to look at wildflowers and ended up staring at this beautiful uh, cap cloud while it seemed stationary, hugging um, the peak of Mount Rainier. It was stunning. Um, another cloud that I encountered um, was, um, uh, it's an optical phenomena called a glory uh, that occurs in water droplet clouds. And for those of you who, who fly and are lucky enough to get a window seat, um, if you are positioned so that the sun is on one side of you, it can cast a shadow onto of the plane onto the cloud layer and also refract the light, the sunlight in a certain way to create this circular um, light sort of rainbow around you. It's a really stunning um, experience to see that in the cloud. So these these um, are the sort of uh, icons essentially for one one chapter in my book just to give you a sample of um, uh, what the book what the book is about and some of the areas it explores. Every chapter discusses one of those ten words and one of the ten cloud types. So here um, is a, a, a I won't read in detail, but more of the um, the fascinating um, insight into the uh, the condensation nuclei, those little bits of dust and pollen that you see here. Um, interesting, though, we don't think about these small particles, um, but after a rainstorm, don't we all notice how fresh the air seems? And that's because the cloud droplets, the rain droplets, have taken out of the atmosphere those particulates and are actually truly cleaning the air and bringing some of those nutrients back into the soil. So I do talk a lot about sort of cloud physics and, and the small particles of what's happening inside the cloud. I'm a person um, I uh, describe as having attention surplus disorder, and I found it very difficult to settle down and watch clouds and to really learn about how they move. I found that being sort of an active person, I was either walking or hiking or paddling or swimming 
biking, to look at the clouds. And I was always moving and never slowing down to really experience the, the, the dynamism of, of the cloud. So I challenged myself to watch a cloud for five minutes every day. And it was um, probably one of the greater research uh, challenges of my career. To sit still for five minutes is difficult, but to look at one cloud for five minutes um, is, was very, very challenging. Um, and I'm going to end here with a, a short section um, from my book about one experience of um, watching a five-minute cloud. I settled my gaze on one cloud, small and flat like all the others that morning. But this one had depth. Had my cloud suddenly puffed out, or was I just now noticing its cotton ball shape? Why was it suddenly expanding and contracting, as if it were breathing? My focus sharpened, and I felt a little boost of adrenaline. Around the edges of my cloud, delicate wisps furled and unfurled like octopus tentacles in a 3D movie. It roiled and churned. Though it was clearly moving gradually to the east, Parts of it appeared to surge westward. The wisps moved in every direction as if they were being poured out from the center of the cloud. Then my cloud got smaller and thinner and began coming apart. Now it was several clouds, then wispy fragments, smaller and paler, and then nothing. My cloud was gone, just like that. Astonished, I kept my, glaze on the, my gaze on the empty patch of blue sky. My heart raced, my throat was dry. I had just witnessed, for this first time in my life, a visible cloud becoming invisible. I had set a five minute alarm, and when my alarm sounded, I startled. I had forgotten where I was. I wasn't sure where my body began and ended. My watching had become seeing, and then my seeing had become something else something more full-bodied and fluid, something like breathing. So over the course of writing uh, A Sideways Look at Cloud, I developed a um, deep and abiding relationship with the clouds, which was um, a, a surprise to me. I didn't expect to feel emotionally attached to the clouds, but they, they feel kind of like, like buddies now. Um, and this relationship has really um, brought me joy and even solace at times when I needed it. And I um, urge all of you, um, if nothing else, just to look up more often and notice what you see um, and bring these phenomenal natural wonders um, into your life in the outdoors, uh, five minutes uh, at a time, one Latin word at a time, or one chapter at a time. Oh, that was great, Maria. Thanks. So we have uh, some questions. Great. And one of them, let's see, the first one, Philip asks, are there any types of clouds disappearing? Are people observing new types of clouds? Okay, just let me get my cam on here. Just one second. Okay, one second here. Okay, there we go. Um, it, it's hard to know. We do have a, a two, two stories that I talk about in, in um, a sideways look at cloud, and one is the um, uh, naming of a new cloud, and this was um, the World Meteorological Organization um, has been publishing the International Cloud Atlas since 1896, and they just published their new digital edition this past year, and um, included a new cloud called Alcocumulus undulatus aspiritus. And that new name was um, the work of the Cloud Appreciation Society. And people were sending pictures, as I did, um, um, pictures of clouds to the Cloud Appreciation Society saying, what kind of cloud is this? And more and more people were sending these clouds beginning in 2006. And the founder of the um, Cloud Appreciation Society, Gavin Prater Pinney, realized that he was getting pictures from all over, um, all over the globe, the same kinds of pictures. And the World Meteorological Organization said, "Well, they're they're not. It's not a new cloud type, so we're not going to come up with a new name. It's probably just a cloud people haven't noticed before." Um, so they were content calling it Alto Cumulus undulatus. But 
with more um, persistent lobbying from the Cloud Appreciation Society, um, they agreed that this seemed to be a new cloud type, and they added a name onto the end of it, um, Aspiritus, which means roughen. This is a really fascinating looking kind of Armageddon cloud that it looks like you're underwater uh, with the ocean waves breaking up, uh, over you, um, a very undulating, um, very dramatic uh, cloud. So that's a new cloud uh, type, but does and I'm not sure anyone is really going to commit uh, to say whether it's new or newly observed. Um, the Cloud Atlas, um, the digital edition which came out um, in March, does include um, several new names of clouds. Um, one I love is um, um, Flamagenitus, which means born of flames. So clouds that form over forest fires are known as Cumulus Flamagenitus. Um, kind of fun. Um, contrails um, are, if they persist, these are the jet um, condensation trails um, um, following a, a jet aircraft. Um, those are known as um, cirrus homogenitus, meaning that man has created them. They're born of man and they're cirrus clouds. So they are uh, a new type of cloud. Certainly those clouds didn't exist a um, hundred years ago. Um, and as far as clouds going extinct or, or we're losing clouds, um, the fogs, the fog um, area of cent the Central Valley in California, um, known the fogs there are known as the Thule fogs, and they're they're notorious. They're um, caused major car accidents. They're a natural fog, but a hazard to motorists. And the California Highway Department set up this really elaborate fog detection and warning system to reduce the incidence of um, accidents um, by motorists. And shortly after they installed it, um, the fogs didn't show up um, so much anymore. So that, um, I don't know the latest research um, on the causes of that, but certainly the clouds are changing. Um, they're also, there's a science showing that they, the clouds are moving toward the poles. Um, and also, um, clouds, um, because of what we are pumping into the atmosphere in terms of um, uh, condensation nuclei, the composition of the clouds is changing. So we might see a beautiful uh, cumulus cloud, but we don't know what's at the center of those cloud droplets. And often, it's chemicals that can um, cause uh, damage to, to, to the landscape, um, such as acid rain and that. Um, clouds are considered the uh, wild card in conversations of climate change because there is so much sort of unknown about um, their, their, their role in moderating uh, the climate um, in the future. Okay, well, um, Margaret asks, speaking of um, unknowns, we know that the clouds are constantly forming and disappearing, changing shape and color, morphing from one type to the next, but are they changing in other ways too? Um, yes, and I think the, the previous question sort of addressed that a little bit. They, they are changing. The, the chemical composition of clouds um, is definitely, it has been changing since the Industrial Revolution um, when our atmosphere um, has been um, um, dramatically altered by the combustion of, of fossil fuels and other other chemicals. So, um, in terms of in terms of climate change and changing clouds, the big the big uh, question here is um, how are how is the changing climate affecting the clouds, and how are those changed clouds affecting the Earth and the ability of the Earth to moderate its temperature? Uh, clouds are considered uh, Earth's thermostats. So they have a dual function. Uh, they trap heat close to the earth to keep it warm and to moderate temperatures. And they also reflect heat away from the earth. Certain clouds do uh, cool better, more efficiently. Certain cl other clouds uh, trap heat more efficiently. So changing the balance of those clouds um, and the um, ability of those clouds to, to perform their functions is um, a, a, a serious problem. And scientists are really now just beginning to grapple with, um, with the, the role of clouds um, in, in climate change. Um, and they are finding changes to the clouds, especially clouds, for instance, that, that um, the condensation nuclei um, prevents the cloud from um, growing large enough to, to rain. So they, won't, they don't form rain droplets. These are infertile clouds. Um, it looks like they're going to rain, and then and then they don't. 
So there is a lot of science, um, and I'm on. Um, I get lots of emails about the changing atmosphere and clouds, and it's it's uh, it's uh, a, lo a lot of science is being done right now. A um, lot of research into this field. Here's a question um, uh, about sort of citizen science. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of the bird count. So yeah. if you're uh, if you're a cloud enthusiast, Sharon asks. Um, or a science educator, and someone's just looking at clouds. And um, is is there any way she she wants to know? Is there a way to participate as a citizen scientist in cloud research? There definitely is. Uh, NASA runs a fabulous program called Globe Observer. Um, they it's a citizen science um, program and a uh, teacher education program, and they are encouraging people to um, use their smartphones. You download an app and you photograph the clouds at the same time the NASA satellites are flying over, which gives the NASA scientists data on what the clouds look like from above and below, which is incredibly valuable. And there, there is not enough money to pay scientists to photograph clouds all over the Earth as satellites pass over. So the citizen contribution is significant and is being used in, in publications. So that is a way to do it, and I can post on my website or Mountaineer's website the link to that. But if you look up the Globe, uh, Globe Observer Program um, through NASA, it's a, it's a great resource, and there's teacher trainings and workshops and online training, and citizen, citizen scientists, uh, if you, even if you're not a teacher, can participate and make a, a contribution. So, okay, here's, here's a, um, a, a very different sort of question. Julio asks, what's your favorite work of art, visual, literary, musical, depicting clouds? Mm. I like that question. That's us. So do I. Um, it is Georgia O'Keeffe's painting in the Seattle Art Museum called Celebration. And it is a beautiful, um, narrow, panel, sort of like a, 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 a Chinese painting scroll style of painting, and it is tucked right around the corner. You kind of come upon it um, by surprise. It's not set out um, like a big famous masterpiece on a gilt frame. It's very subtle, and when you, it just is so exuberant, and the cloud forms are recognizable, but stylized in the Georgia O'Keeffe way, and um, the, that painting was... Um, um, earlier, in an earlier version of my book, I got completely derailed in Georgia O'Keeffe's life and um, her artwork and her relationship with Alfred Steiglitz. And that painting um, um, is the celebration, essentially, of, of their relationship, of their, of their love. And it was painted um, at Lake George in New York, where they spent a lot of time. Um, the location doesn't matter. It's an exuberant cloud wherever you are looking at clouds. And if you're in uh, Seattle, uh, I'd recommend recommend you you stop in and spend some time um, in front of it. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a, more of a uh, an everyday understanding uh, weather question. And um, Anne asks uh, that she sees the H's and the L's, the highs and the lows on weather maps. But she doesn't really know what that means and what it has to do with clouds. That's a good question. <laughs> that, that's another one um, I, I tackled in the chapter on atmosphere. Um, not only did I not know where the atmosphere was, I didn't know what was in the atmosphere. And I had a real problem understanding air pressure. And um, air pressure. We think, well, I, I don't feel it. We think of air as being light as air and into thin air. Where is the pressure coming from? And what I learned was that pressure is just another word for weight. So in the language of clouds, we have all this confusing Latin names, and we also have a lot of meteorological words that are also confusing. So the high and low pressure really threw me, because when you're thinking about clouds, you think high is altitude high, and low is altitude low. In fact, H and L, high means um, heavy, that's how I remember it, high pressure, and L is light or low pressure. So now, why, why is there high pressure? Um, in our atmosphere, uh, it, we have um, mostly uh, nitrogen, 78% uh, nitrogen and 22% oxygen. Those uh, molecules have weight. And 
as temperatures change, those molecules lose energy and they start moving closer and closer together and basically kind of compress and add to the weight uh, downward pressure on the Earth. So if you can imagine uh, low pressure um, being um, uh, light pressure, uh, you have uh, the molecules are further apart and there's less pressure on the Earth, less weight of air on the Earth. Um, so in terms of cloud development, under high pressure, basically you have the nitrogen and oxygen primarily um, weighing down on the Earth and inhibiting cloud development. And those would be the clouds that form by uh, thermals, warm thermals rising up. So if you have high pressure, the weight of the air is essentially suppressing cloud formation. Under low pressure, you don't have that weight. The molecules are further apart and clouds can form um, by rising thermals, rising warm air. So the H and L is, is confusing because it's high and low, but if you think of it again as heavy and light, um, I'm hoping that helps you. I'm, I'm a person that get, gets confused in a car when red means heat and blue means cold on the uh, temperature for the car heater. I think it should be white and orange for snow and fire, but so basic things like that confuse me and I, was, I had to admit quite often every step of the way in this book that I really don't know anything about anything and I got a chance to learn it and figure out why my brain was working the way it was and why, why I didn't understand um, some basic things like pressure and air has weight. So thank you for the question. <laughs> Here, here's another one. Um, somebody you might bump into in your hometown. She's or Kim says, coincidentally, I grew up in D.C. and fell in love, uh, fell in love with clouds after moving to Olympia. Do you think there is something about the Pacific Northwest cloudscapes that draws fascination? Hmm. That is an interesting question. I, um, gosh. I think possibly it's because people here spend a lot of time outdoors and we are geared to spending time outdoors and putting on rain gear and being being outdoors in you know in the mountains and the lakes and the rivers um, on the coast and it's possible we have um, um, uh, more clouds around us that Olympia. I was horrified to learn has clouds 228 days of the year. So maybe it's something that's so ever present. Um, although I know people in the Midwest and you know in in uh, in Colorado on the East Coast and all around the world, they say you've got to come here. We have the greatest clouds. So I don't know. I I found that people, um, in my experience, were were not really paying attention to the clouds. But I think once you begin to realize you you've got to live under them and with the rain and kind of deal with it, um, you become more aware um, and have a, a different relationship with, with the weather. Okay, great. Well, we've drawn to the end of our hour, and we really appreciate you being with us. That was a lot of fun. And thank you, audience, for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the presentation. Maria was only able to share a bit of what she learned in her quest to understand clouds, but you can get it all in her book, of course which you'll find wherever books are sold, and also on our website, mountaineersbooks.org. And if you use the code up in the sky, all one word, up in the sky, you'll receive a 20% discount on Maria's new book. And that code again is up in the sky, one word. But if you don't have a pencil, don't worry. We will email you the code in a day or two when we send you a recording of this show. And uh, next month, our next presentation, um, is on October 24th with the artist Molly Hashimoto, the author of Colors of the West, An Artist's Guide to Nature's Palette. Molly specializes in in-plane air painting, which is painting outdoors and specifically nature, and she's also an art teacher. So even if you're not an artist yet, you should join us. This will be a great opportunity to find out if sketching and painting nature is something you could really do. I hope you can join us. In the meantime, we also hope you have a terrific time outdoors, feeling the fresh air, listening to running creeks, wondering about clouds, and just in general having fun and marveling at the beauty that's all around us. 
So thank you very much for joining us and thank you again, Maria. You're welcome. Good night, everyone.